President John Adams called him the most accomplished man in Europe, and his wizardry on the violin in the concert hall was perhaps only equaled by his technical prowess on the fencing strip. And he fought in the French Revolution despite being done wrong by his superiors because he always fought for what he believed was right. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Joseph was born in the New World, on the island of Guadeloupe, to a wealthy planter and an African slave. Unlike many illegitimate children, his father loved him and wanted the best for him, and he knew that the best life for his son was outside of the Lesser Antilles. In 1753, when Joseph was seven years old, they moved to France. This was done so Joseph could get a proper education, and by the time he was a teenager, he was famous as a fencer. Racist Frenchmen who believed that they could beat him because he was black were sorely mistaken. And I mean sorely, really. I've fenced. It, it can hurt. His father was very proud of his accomplishments, and he became well-known in his own right after his father returned to the overseas plantations. Like all good Frenchmen, he could dance and was well-versed in music, but that's really all we know of his early musicianship. History first encounters reference to his skills as a violinist when he was 18, when two violin concerti were published bearing a dedication to him. Within seven years, he was the concertmaster of an established orchestra, with which he played his own violin concertos. In all, he would write over a dozen of them for himself to play, as well as a number of chamber pieces, built off of the accomplishments of who else but Franz Joseph Haydn. He was able to pull off virtuosic techniques theretofore unavailable or thought impossible because of his background as a fencer, that pinpoint control over where his hand was, combined with recent bow innovations. He was among the first French composers to write Haydnesque string quartets in that they treated each of their voices as equal parts of the texture. Upon his graduation, he became, technically speaking, a knight, or chevalier. Now the full-fledged music director of the orchestra in which he was the concertmaster for many years, he turned it into one of the leading performing ensembles in all of Europe. The Queen was even known to sneak in on occasion, without any fanfare, which is really rare for French aristocracy, and at one point he played one of his violin sonatas while being accompanied by Marie Antoinette at the keyboard. But it wasn't all rosy for the Chevalier. He was popular amongst the ladies, yes, but his race made it so that he only had one serious relationship in his entire life, and he never married. When his father died, he didn't see a penny of the inheritance. He would have taken over as music director of the foundering Paris Opera in 1776, had not several sopranos bonded together in order to stop his appointment, because they said that they would refuse to work under someone of mixed race. Ironically, this rebuttal at the hands of a premier operatic institution actually got him interested in opera in the first place, and after this episode, we really don't see him writing any sort of instrumental music. He turned his attention 100% towards opera. His first opera actually wasn't much to write home about at all, and it left him nearly broke. Luckily, the aristocracy still liked him quite a bit, and so he was able to take up residence at the behest of the Marquise de Montezon. Or wouldn't you know it, Mozart was also staying. The two knew each other then, but apparently they didn't get along at all. Mozart called the French generally immoral and musically illiterate, and he was also not in the best financial situation either. When the Chevalier's second opera was premiered to wide acclaim, it enraged Mozart because he felt that his music was stronger. While it's unknown if the black villain in the Magic Flute is based off of the Chevalier, no serious scholar would be surprised if evidence for that turned up. The financial upheaval caused by the American Revolution disbanded the Chevalier's orchestra, although at the behest of wealthy patrons they'd get the orchestra back together for several reunion concerts in subsequent years. Deaths among his aristocratic patrons left him untethered, and really nervous about where his future was, and this manifested itself in the beginning of anti-monarchist sympathies. With King George III in a steadily collapsing state of mental health, it was decided that the Chevalier would act as a diplomat to go over to Britain and secure good relations with the future king, as well as lobby for the abolition of slavery. Both goals met with moderate success, and his most notable achievements in the British Isles included a fencing match against a famous crossdresser, as well as, of course, performing his own violin concerti. His abolitionist endeavors did not go unnoticed. At one point, he was beaten up by a quartet of thugs for his trouble, only to perform that evening like a boss. At one point, he won a fencing tournament while running an extremely high fever that turned out to be a case of meningitis that left him unconscious for several days and bedridden for over a month. When he started feeling well enough again, he thanked his caretakers by writing them an opera. When the French Revolution broke out, 
the Chevalier signed up to fight for his ideals. Alexandre Dumas, the father of the novelist, was actually one of his lieutenant colonels. His regiment was composed of free Haitians and other men of color, and the Chevalier, now a colonel, protested when they were going to be sent to the front lines without so much as the most basic of basic training. His high-class background made him an easy target for those looking to imprison or kill the aristocracy. In the finding that they saw the Chevalier distinguish himself as an honorable leader who fought hard and fought for his principles above all else. But the higher-ups were still wary of his aristocratic background, and after a siege in the Netherlands went slightly awry, used the opportunity to arrest him and his officers. Most of the officers got off scot-free, in fact, Dumas actually went on to become a general, but the Chevalier was locked up in prison for over a year while the Reign of Terror went on outside. While never charged with any crime, the Chevalier lived in fear for his life, until he was eventually set free. It took six more months post-imprisonment for him to be reinstated in the army in his old position as a colonel. But that didn't last long either. In the intervening time, his legion had two new colonels, one of which had the Chevalier deposed from the army pretty much permanently. News of the French Revolution had reached the overseas colonies, and they decided, not without good reason, that it was the perfect time for a slave revolt. The Chevalier paid a visit to one of these islands that was in the midst of a civil war, but he saw no active duty and was not actually a military commander. His mind was now on music again, his old love, and he wanted to start a new orchestra. He was very proud of the fact that he kept up his violin skills, and he rated his skills at the instrument in his later years to be the finest he'd ever played. The Chevalier passed away from a bladder condition in 1799, at the age of 53, having led a life that aged him far beyond his calendar years. In his life, he was known as one of the top violinists and composers, and was even known as the Black Mozart for his prodigiousness and his ability to write great operas. But saying that he's the Black Mozart really doesn't do him justice as an individual. It's as unfair as saying that Mozart was the white Chevalier de Saint-Georges. It just shouldn't work that way. And saying that he's a black Mozart really doesn't acknowledge him on his own merits. The truth is that he was extremely well-rounded, and music, while a significant part of his life, was just that, a part of his life. And you can't understand him simply as a musician. This moniker seems to come from concert posters where the two would receive equal billing, something that probably would also have ticked Mozart off. About a third of his compositions have survived the ravages of time, but what we do have is on par with any of the big names of the era. His unjust neglect probably shouldn't be pinned on racism alone. After all, he was incredibly popular in his day. Rather, it has to do with his seemingly aristocratic background and the fact that his music was shunned and banned and his manuscripts destroyed during the Napoleonic era. But as recent musicology has become interested in obscure names and bringing them to light, so too do we discover gems like the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Mm -hmm. 